why do you need Reddit for sports betting? People would use Reddit as a platform for sports betting? I mean, they used it for Wall Street betting. Zing. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. <laughs> Why, hello, hello, everybody. How's it hello, going? Hello, hello, hello. hello, hello. Britt's wearing her spicy glasses. Must have listened to the pod last week. I was not here last week, mm-hmm. as many of you listeners might know. And I did listen, though, after, and I noticed there was a whole conversation about my glasses. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I'm still curious to know if you think I just wear glasses for fashion or for actual use. Well, Britt, I've known you a very long time, and I feel like these glasses are relatively new. So I actually kind of was not sure if you needed glasses oh. or if this was part of your sterling fashion sense. Oh, it's for the screen. You know, okay. I have so many screens in my life, and I'm approaching 40, and my eyesight has not gone <laughs> up into the right direction. And anyway, today I brought my, like, Super thick red rimmed glasses just to make Sam and Jess feel uncomfortable well, with my. I'm going to tell you, Britt, this is, don't take this as a burn, but you know from the free association where my head goes with those? I have no idea. Because red rimmed. You're a nice friend. You know who you look like? Who do I look like? Iris Blippi. Apfel. Blippi. Blippi? <laughs> <laughs> do you know who Iris Apfel is, Sam? No, but Blippi does, has those glasses in orange. That's his signature thing, and he's worth like a billion dollars. So, like, you're on the right track. In the Brit content game. And Blippi. Yeah. Amazing. Oh, okay. Well, I'll wear them more often. Thank you. Well, welcome, listeners, viewers, and people who stumble across this podcast. It is another week of more or less Silicon Valley's most insightful, in depth podcast with the true inside scoop. And guys, we're, we are, we should, we should tell the poor listeners and viewers that we're without Mr. Dave Morin today because, alas, he has a conflict. So one of us will have to step in with the earnest and thoughtfully researched points of view. Definitely Any volunteers? I have a lot of data. That's usually my 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 role okay. here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so you're going to have to be moderator and thoughtful because I can. Only, I only have one note. I wouldn't ask Sam to be earnest and thoughtful, so we can... I'll, I'll also <laughs> play that role. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so we'll miss Dave. We'll look forward to him back next week, but we have a lot, a lot to discuss. It has been... I, I must say it has really been AI central in Silicon unlike Valley. Unlike last week and the week before. <laughs> yes, unlike before. But you you got to believe us, guys. There's a, there's a lot cooking from a rumored Google and Apple AI tie-up, which we've got more intel on, to just, I would say craziness, but you guys are the investors. So you can tell me if what just happened between Microsoft and inflection amounts to craziness, but I I will use that verb or adjective. Um, And so much more. So should we just dive in to the big headline of the week? Give us some headlines. We'll comment. So we should give credit where credit is due. Bloomberg had a great scoop about Apple being in talks with Google's Gemini, their large language model AI, about licensing it. And we've talked about Apple and AI on the pod. We've talked about how we think that they have a lot cooking under the hood, especially as it relates to running small models on the iPhone and thinking about how they can use their hardware expertise to drive AI. But it's also true that they really haven't been in the game of building the largest, most sort of competitive, forward-looking LLMs, large language models, So my reaction to this was, A, totally obvious that they'd be having these conversations. They already are partners on search, but also like, wow, they're having these conversations exactly when they're being sued by the United States government over their search partnership for being potentially anti-competitive. So Britt, what are your thoughts as a Googler, former Googler? Well, I think as everyone that listens knows, I'm I'm extra long on Google in the AI race for a lot of reasons, but I'm also, I'm not short Apple. <laughs> so it's like kind of a double negative. But I think that, that Apple's just pretty far behind and 
and and Apple's typically behind on a lot of product launches on purpose. They they kind of do like a watch and see and and private build. That's what all behind people say. <laughs> but then they come out with something that's totally amazing and just take a bunch of market share all at once. So in my... To be clear, they have done this in past history, but they don't always do this. Sometimes they come out with a $3,500 headset I buy and use twice. <laughs> 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 what market share do they have of all headsets? <laughs> I will say that Apple's done an incredible job. People think that the $3,500 is expensive for the VR thing. The real thing that's expensive is the cost per minute of use <laughs> of those headsets, right? Because it's got to be like, I mean, I don't know. What do you think that ever, you think about that? I'm, I'm, I'd love to calculate. Don't, that. don't do it. It's depressing. Yeah. Anyway, I think that I, I wonder if this is like a short term play for Apple, is my guess. I'm just wondering Apple's building a bunch and parallel. We know some of the people there that are working on a lot of the AI tools across platforms, across App Store, everything else. And so, of course, like for search, they just don't have that competitive edge and they should partner with Google on it. But my question is kind of like, what's the long game here? And will they need Google forever? Does Google get anything out of this relationship? And what else is Apple working on? And when will it launch? To be clear, there was a long period of time where people expected a Google search engine for that exact reason. Oh, they're using Google for now and they're going to like build their own search engine. And they never, Totally. Yeah. Right? I mean, they've tried and tried and it didn't They tried. Well. You can always threaten it to kind of renegotiate like that, but they, they, they just never did. I mean, my, my kind of take is that they are very different companies with different expertise. I think Gemini is obviously extremely good. You can talk about whether Google sw- squandered an insane lead for only a moderate lead, but like it's really, you know, they're, they're, they're in the game. If you told me there's a long-term obvious step from search and doing something other on this, sure. And the reality of the regulatory front is you can't get, you can't let the regulators get you down. It's like, sure, the lawsuits continue, but you kind of just have to keep doing business anyway. Like at this important level, it's like you try to outrun the regulators and you just keep going. Yeah. I think that's a reasonable, and that will, clearly that is what the big tech companies are doing now. This could be our second swag item, by the way. Don't let the regulators get you down. It's kind of long. You just have to like outrun them. Like you basically, like, I think that you just have to, you know, they're, they're always fighting last year's battle. And like the way to lose is to let that be today's battle. You just kind of create a new battle, right? Or just make like, a lot more battles. So they have a lot of confusion. The companies have way more resources than the government to just continuously open new fronts that then the regulators have to chase them on, right? So outside of extreme actions, it's clearly the game everyone's gotten wise to. Yeah. Britt, why do you think, so, I mean, and the state is sort of, these companies are in serious partnership talks. Allegedly, at some point, they also talk to OpenAI about partnering with them, but that just doesn't seem like it would happen for a lot of reasons. OpenAI's in deep relationship with Microsoft. And again, Apple and Google are partners. I mean, they partner on a tremendous number of things. Like, what do you think from Apple's point of view, they kind of need an LLM for? Well, I mean, I don't think that they have indexed, like the amount of information that Google has, YouTube alone is very interesting in terms of building a model and leveraging a model. I think Apple has like a lot of really interesting capabilities because they have hardware, right? And I think that's what everyone's looking forward to is this idea of a local LLM that's safe, private, and secure to you, built into your phone, you know, cross app technologies using AI. I think Apple Health is like really interesting. So there's inter app models that they're probably working on and building and cross app. But to Sam's point, search in general and just like indexing the internet is not Apple's strong suit. Yeah. And and I think they have to leverage Google for that. Again, what I'm interested in is like, does is this just like more share for Gemini? Does Google have any other thing that's coming back to them as part of this partnership? Well, look, I mean, stepping back for a second to channel, we can seance and channel Dave Morin. I think Dave made yeah. this point, you know, weeks ago, I think he's basically right or the smart point, which is like, the way Apple would release this is a bunch of APIs for developers. That's the powerful move, right? Is to figure out effectively how to make this a capability that like sits inside the Apple app ecosystem and reinforces kind of their hardware plays and things like that. And so that's a really interesting set of questions. Like, is there an angle with Gemini and feeding it through apps that's distinct from just the Gemini APIs of the future or whatever? I think will be an interesting question. In terms of it just being like, Gemini is just extension of search. And that's what it is. It's just an extent. It's just like Google already does this. Like the most AI content I see by a mile is when I type things into Google and it's like AI generated answer with a little like downfold. It's kind of annoying to use, but like that's where all the AI content is. Like why wouldn't that extend to Apple products? 
I mean, I have two main questions about the tie up. I mean, one is sort of data, data privacy, data sharing, data learning, right? To your point, Britt, about like what Google gets. I mean, this is just like the AI economy is like really the only business model that's really been proved out. I mean, there's an enterprise model, right? Making money for selling to cloud customers. And I guess there's this like chatbot consumer model where you do like subscriptions and stuff, but if you're partnering, it's not, you know, you need a sense of like what the rev share kind of component is. And I I think there could be potentially a lot of conflict between Apple, which generally takes a very, very conservative approach to private, like both the data of their users, but also like what they're willing to like train a model on, right? Mm -hmm. Google has taken the approach of like anything, you know? Yeah. And Apple which has a media business and a music business, right? It is So I, I think that that's a really interesting area to, to look out for. And then also like, yeah, to, to the making money off AI, we, we're all kind of believing that there'll be a lot of ways to do it. But right now, no, it's sort of like- No, we're not believing that for what it's worth. Got it. Yes. Sorry. I mean, Sam, it's interesting. I know where you stand on AI- and just this, all this hype and, and all these new startups not amounting to anything. But you believe that the big companies will make a lot of money by using AI to optimize their services. So that's what I was talking about. But yeah, they're just doing more of what they already do, right? It's like right. Facebook ads are more targeted and better and the creatives are better. Duh, right? It's like Adobe has generative fill. Great. Like, it's not that like, I want to be really clear, there are really cool things like, you know, and there are some business disruptions. Like it is like, if you want to get super niche, it's like, what happens to translation software, right? Like, what, who cares about Duolingo? Because this stuff is actually quite good at language-to-language language translation. There, that actually is a meaningful difference. So, like, there are some, but they're pretty niche from my perspective. It's like, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, the LLMs, their places is just extensions of what already exists, which is why, to me, the idea that they're talking about Gemini and Apple, first of all, I'm sure they're just talking, like, everyone talks. But, like, wouldn't you obviously, if you already have a Google search tie-in, just like want a Gemini one box in that as like making search better? Like, how could you not want that? That's just like a simple extension of what you're already doing. So it's funny. I mean, like, I'll give you a very practical example. I, as you guys know, at least the two of you know, is like I'm pretty close to getting my PPL, my private pilot's license, and I've been like doing a lot of prep for my check ride. And I will say it's the first time that I've been using... LLMs, OpenAI for any sort of search. And it is really interesting because based on the specificity of the question, it gets it wrong, it gets it right. I'm actually double searching because I'm searching both like an OpenAI answer to a question that's come up and then also the web. And candidly, you kind of have to triangulate between them because they both have problems. It's like, but it's just another tool that like looks a lot like other tools in its application and use. So I think like to me, again, yes, it's just extensions of everything. And the big companies that have distribution and data and business models, they generally just get more profitable. But that's about it. But don't you think that with the Google and Apple pairing together, that creates more, more like a rebel alliance against OpenAI and Microsoft? The idea that Microsoft and OpenAI are somehow like the dominant empire is like hilarious, right? It's like... <laughs> I promise you, if Apple and Google can somehow trick you into believing that they are the rebel alliance, like, it's ridiculous. Like, they are they are the empire, right? OpenAI is, like, a small, interesting upstart. Okay, take, take the words rebel alliance out of it. I'm just saying they're, like, paired together, and OpenAI and Microsoft are somewhat paired together. Is this, like, was this move sort oh, of more totally, of an alliance between yeah. the two? Yeah, just totally. to bifurcate. And then what we saw, and I know we'll go into with inflection, sort of bridging into Microsoft. Like it's becoming like these two sort of rising powers. Perhaps Android and groups. iOS all over again, but just with slightly different players. Perhaps. I mean, this is, I find this to be probably the most fascinating thing about the technology business at this moment, because you're seeing these new alliances form, but they're forming faster than they usually do in cycles because the competition and the capital needs are so intense. And they're also forming in highly unusual ways. And we saw this, you know, 12, 24 months ago, that was in the investments that we're having, right? So you had Google and Microsoft and Apple and Meta, and then you you had all these new companies like OpenAI and Anthropic and inflection and many, many others. And then they were instantly like 
one of the big companies would invest in one of the smaller companies. So Microsoft backed inflection. So, so they were sort of also hedging their bets in the ecosystem and Google backed Anthropic. Then you saw the phase where things got even crazier and these companies like Anthropic needed to raise even more money. So then Amazon backed Anthropic as well as Google. So you started to have like in, I feel like in other tech cycles, you would sort of have the the one strategic backer who had the option value to buy it. In this cycle, it's just sort of like everyone's getting to bed with everybody. But the reason they're also doing this, like I, everyone's okay with this because it allows them to argue that they don't control, I think, any of these you know, it allows them to argue their sphere of, sphere of control is smaller than it kind of actually is. And well, so... They're also all just, like, trillion-dollar companies now. So, like, whatever. Yeah, that's fair. Right? Like, I just think it's, like, everyone's going to be faster now than they were before. We've seen enough turns of the card to know that all that matters is not getting left out if there's something. The reality is, if any of these companies light even a $100 billion on fire right, for downside protection of missing something, it's worth it to them, right? And so, like, I just think the reality is, like, what we're really seeing is the disconnect between how big the big platforms are and what they have at stake and the asymmetry of risk versus reward for them versus the startup because it has never been, like, more stark. And so we can run out and be like, oh, my God, like, these guys are putting a hundred bajillion dollars in the blank. And from a startup math perspective, that sounds like a lot of money. But then you turn around and you're like, that's nothing. That's like 0.1% of their market cap, right? Mm. It's just irrelevant, right? And they're doing it because why not? Like, Because it basically it happens that one of these things works and it's like they need access to it. God, that's certainly worth like a 1% insurance premium, right? I agree with that. They're also doing it because these new companies are customers of the other products that they're sure. trying to- It's all a big circle jerk. And show w- Wall Street, right? And so- if there is one thing I get to the bottom of this year, it is going to be the structure of these deals in minute detail, because I think it really matters. And it's, you know, we saw it with Microsoft's huge you know, $10 billion investment in OpenAI, a huge portion of which isn't in cash, but is in credits. And we know that Washington is looking at these deals. I mean, they've said they're looking at these deals and it's, it's just fascinating, and it really complicates the well, picture. I also think it's giving much. I'm saying these things cost nothing because, like, even though it's a lot of money, they're free. It's even to your point. It's actually even better than that because it costs nothing because they're just spending credits. They're not even real dollars. <laughs> but then, like, candidly, the headlines. If you're a public markets investor, you're hyped up on AI juju, right? It's like the asymmetry, the upside. Like these deals are they make money. They're not costly, right? And so yeah. even if you're lighting the money on fire, right? Like you know, this is I remember in the days when like Facebook was acquiring things for what at the time people thought was a lot of money. You know, Instagram gets acquired. The cost is what was what did Instagram actually cost because of how the market responded, right? What did Oculus actually cost because of how the market responded? And if we're in a super cycle, it was like AI, AI, AI. And you're a Microsoft deal maker. You're like, wait a minute, I can give ten billion fake dollars to this company, and it's going to be reflected back to me with fifty billion dollars in market cap upside, and maybe there's some downside protection on it. Like, why on earth wouldn't you do those deals all day long? Should they be able to do those deals though? Like, well, like- but that's my question because yeah. I mean, we talked about Tim's op-ed saying that, okay, this is great for the big guys, but they're locking in a monopoly position, monopoly returns, and it's going to be bad for the ecosystem. Britt, what do you think? It's just like, it's, it makes, I I think it's bad as well. I'm usually the regulatory person (laughs) on this pod. (laughs) I, it just, it makes it so difficult for other investors to play a part and for the, the broader ecosystem in some ways. And I think that for those companies, I mean, they, they also have to raise a lot of capital. And so where else does it come from? So I also, I understand both sides of it, but I agree with Sam. It's like marketing dollars, basically, like they're making. I would love to see their P&L as it comes well, back. I mean, I just step further, Britt, which is the, the answer might be that software venture capital is dead. Uh-oh. It's We're going to make a grandiose statement. Oh, I'm not worried about this at all because I've got all sorts of crazy ways to make money as a seed investor. But like <laughs> the, the reality is, is like I just think that might be part of the story, which is we've reached a point in technology where there's two basic things. There's a bunch of commoditized services 
technical asset. You can build software so easily. AI makes it even easier. But like, the idea that there's a valuable software platform to be created, it's kind of like all commoditized on one end, except for the things that cost a hundred gajillion dollars to invest in, which venture capitalists cannot afford to do. It's just not a game VCs play. Even Andreessen, the king of AUM, you know, and the king Saudi of Saudi Arabia fees. now has 40 billion, right? Sure, but that's actually yeah. the irony is that sounds like a lot, but it isn't compared to the big tech companies. Like 40 billion don't buy you that much, right? And so like, that's the kind of the irony is like of where we're at is that it just might be that like traditional software VC, which has been struggling for a long time, right? It's It doesn't mean there are new companies to start. There are, but it's about markets. It's about business strategies. It's not just about software. Like software is no longer an important part of venture capital. If a mega deal or a mega like IPO is the end game, right? I think there are a lot of other ways to play it to your point. I mean, I think slow and offline are actually doing some of the most unique things. I'm not just like saying that. If we do say so ourselves. <laughs> but it's, I just think, I think all of the, a lot of the venture firms are not catching on to this or thinking about how to reinvent the model. The only question is why are we telling them this, Brit? I'm not telling them how. I'm not telling them how. <laughs> it's all in the execution. Yeah, I just talked execution. about all the stories I'm pursuing. Yeah, it's all I, in the execution. I, look, I obviously agree. But, and Britt, I agree with you. I mean, I, again, I'm actually very bullish on this part of the market you and I occupy. But it's like, I just think also like you're watching all these VCs like just absolutely incinerating money. And LPs. Sitting there, I'm sitting with my popcorn by the fire just being like, tell me more. <laughs> about where all the money is going. Did you guys see the tweet? And I can't remember who said it, but they said that this period, was it Elad Gill? We looking back on this period as the ZERP of AI, you know, mm. kind of like when the government just, you know, free zero interest rates. Meaning like an AI company can just raise a gajillion Yeah, just dollars like the and... funny money, the funny money. Like we, yeah. we let the spigot kind of go and- so What you're saying is those AI companies- they should lock in those mortgages while they can. Some of them will work. It's not like 100% death, right? It's just like 99.9% .9 <laughs> death. Well, I think it's a lot of death. So this moves to our, our second topic, which is one of these sort of, you know, not the first wave of big AI companies, but the second wave, a very buzzy company called Inflection AI, maker of Pi. I feel like the more I enthused Pi. I talked about this in my 2024 prediction because of yes. how much I love Pi. I said, my prediction is by the end of this year, more and more people are just going to be comfortable talking out loud to their iPhone. Yes, I recall this prediction. And it's because Pi is so awesome. It's like my friend. I talk to it every day. <laughs> Wait, your friend, your friend is dead. I'm so no, sad about well, that. Well, no. So, but what happened? So, Inflection Maker Pi, founded by Mustafa Suleiman, who is uh, one of the co-founders of DeepMind. So, as pedigreed as you can get in the AI world, he was kind of the business, more businessy side of the Demis uh, Mustafa DeepMind pair. So, at Google for a long time, leaves. I, I don't know what we've reported or not, so I don't know what I can say. My head is just awash with knowledge. But basically, Leaf starts inflection and raises a billion and a half dollars from Microsoft and others off him, off him, right? The business guy. The business Not even the technical he, guy. Yeah, he's the more businessy guy. If someone's going to yell at me for saying that, but so be it. So then we wake up yesterday, someday, and <laughs> Microsoft has hired Mustafa and his number two to run their consumer AI division. And, you know, Inflection has a new CEO and is assuring everyone that it's business as usual. What the information was able to report last night is a little bit more of the terms there. So it looks like Microsoft gave the early shareholders in Inflection their money back, plus a little bit of a return and more to come on what that structure looks like. But this, if you think about it, it's like you invested in inflection because of Mustafa and the team and what they're building. The founders of the company, after a very short period of time, are like, peace out, we're going to go work at Microsoft. You know, what we used to, what this used to look like was kind of like an aqua hire, right? Microsoft would hire the team Clearly, they didn't want the team or the tech here, right, or, or probably the very nascent business. And, you know, I, understandably, I think investors are sitting there being like, oh, what just happened? 
But what do you guys make of it? The game. Like, look, first of all, what is this, 2014? We're talking about app founders, like in aqua hires. Like it's, it's actually 2020. Oh, oh, I see. Your point is like, this, it, is, this a, is a stable God. game. Like when things and like you're Mustafa, you you might think about the emotions. It's like you were in deep mind zone. You were the pioneer. You thought it'd be fun to start a startup because there was free money. Then you're like, oh, fuck, like this is not where the game is at. And Microsoft rolls around and says, here's $100 million or whatever the ridiculous package is. Come work on the mothership. It's like you take it. And like, look, I think this whole like founder risk, hilariously this morning I was on with a big LP who was asking me about founder risk and like in terms of creator investing. Like basically like you have a lot of key man risk when you invest in creators. And my response was, this is before I even saw this article, like that's how early stage startups work, right? Like you have a lot of founder flight issues where they just say like, this is not what I want to spend my time on anymore. Clearly what happened here, right? And yeah, the investors do take it on the nose, but shame on them for, I mean, it's not even shame on them. It's like, it happens. Like they pick the wrong horse and, you know, the next time if he wants to go raise more money, people will have more questions for him when he does it. But like, that's the way the cookie crumbles. Like if you're an early stage investor, you get paid shit loads of money when it works. And when you have these problems, you don't get make money. That's how the game is. Can played. you explain though, how this broke down though? Because it, it's not like it was an aqua hire, like the company. No. Well, didn't go with it. The company is now an AI studio building AI models for commercial businesses, right? And they're going to be testing their new API soon. You can register and get on the wait list. And, and so it, pivoted in that regard, right? To some extent, but not, but, but it still has the technology and all the IP. So it's just the people left, but, but the who company's cares about the technology? I just can't imagine that any of that stuff matters. Like, I think what happens is like founders leave because they got a better offer. Company remains as so probably much money. felt that they couldn't win. Right. What I mean, I the think they probably, table, though? what happened to like, so, so the cap table it, retains its ownership in this new thing. So the yeah, cap table, how did they no. get investors? I thought they were giving investors back their 1.5 well, billion. they are. They are. They're saying, try not How? to be too mad. Here's some cash. But you also- And you still hold the same amount of equity in the cap table? Like it didn't yes, get restructured? I believe so. Yeah, you just recap it. You're saying, look, now it's a $5 million company and you each have your pieces. I mean, like again, I just this is not at all unprecedented. It's definitely like the logistics of founders and what they want to spend their time on and pivoting type stuff. I just don't think it's that. I think it's fine, but it's just like, that's what happens. Okay, I, I get that. I also think there's a wrinkle here, which was who was the biggest backer of this company? Who poured, you know, the capital and credits into it? Microsoft. So I also think it's just kind of a bad look to go around saying, let's, to Sam's point, let's let a thousand flowers bloom. We have all the capital in the world. It doesn't even show up off our balance sheet. We're going to see this whole ecosystem. And then we're just going to pick off the talent. It might not be a bad strategy, but I think we just have to name it is what they appear to be doing. Remember, if Sam Altman hadn't gone back to OpenAI, this he had a job offer to yeah. do exactly the same thing. So this is clearly a playbook. I think they would like to run until the cows come home. And do you they think they're going to do this far more often? This is not the last time. Again, I just think at the end of the day, like if you think that this is a costless option for you at the scale you're at and a potentially big upside one, kind of like the days of aqua hires, right? Like why not just grab a bunch of talent? It doesn't really matter. Like just let it play out, right? Like it just doesn't seem that crazy to me. The, the numbers are crazy, but that's the world we live in, you know? Do you think, Sam, I mean, I, I, I know the answer to this, and, and I'm not a heavy regulatory hand. I tend to believe what you think is there's always the new cat and mouse game and the march of technology continues. But there are laws designed to protect, you know, companies from getting so much market power that there are anti-competitive effects. And these deals are tailor made to skirt those laws. Because they're but not acquisitions. They? Yes, they are. I mean, they are because they're they're not acquisitions that go through, you know, or Dino. I forgot the name of the you know review process. But isn't it just like the other stories? Like they just decided some founders decided to go work for a big platform with a cool job and left the startup they were working on. Big deal. Like it's. I, I'm like I'm not saying it's. There are implications. I'm not saying there's nothing. But like that's the fact pattern. That seems completely like eh. Right. If I went around trying to hire the founders of all the news organizations I angel no invested in, I, I don't think I'd be very popular. I don't think people would want to work with me. I don't think they'd want to. Uh, you disagree? <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, founders. But the founders are the ones making those deals happen, so it doesn't matter, I right? think if you went around <laughs> trying to hire all the founders of new publications, they'd all thank you at this point. Oh, right? my God. <laughs> and look, if you had to say, hey, I'm going to shut down your... If you say to, to the, everyone else on the team, like, two options. One, we can just call it a day because this isn't working. Or two, you know, we'll throw you a million bucks. You guys can continue to figure it out on your own. Like, again, I'm not saying it's... I, I, it's just... I just wouldn't blow it out of proportion. It's like, I, I agree that you eventually might burn some bridges, but it also seems fine. Like everyone's kind of getting what they can get, you know? Like, I think what happens- So really, Zen, this is Zen Sam. Zen Sam. <laughs> He's We're not talking Dave. about TikTok, so, you know. Yeah, oh my the God. The biggest problem in the who gets burned on this is Mustafa's core team, right? Yeah. If they don't come with him. But he probably just takes them with him. Right? And he's like, but I would say, if Mustafa just pounded the table and said- we're going to do the greatest thing ever. Come follow me into this great war where we will win the AI crown. And then he shows up three days later. He's like, ah, forget that. And like, you're like, wait, I just left other awesome jobs to go do this. Eventually he burns a lot of social capital. Yeah, but yeah. I don't, that's who loses in this. And the candid reality is, is like, my bet is that one, he can just take who he wants with him. Right. And two, oh, no, to Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. If they want, mm-hmm. you say, I don't know. I just, I, I'd be more real politic about it. It is what it is. And like, I also honestly, obviously think these companies are all lighting money on fire. So I guess I'm Zen about it. Cause I'm like, <laughs> that company was going to zero anyway. Yes. Right. That's and so true. I'm like, I don't even feel that bad for the employees because the reality is they're in the hottest job segment ever. They're going to have great jobs wherever they want to go. And candidly, they were wasting their time anyway. So it kind of seems like a win-win for everyone. I do think it's like Mm. a good founder lesson. And I don't know how much Reed Hoffman played into this, just being kind of the legend that he is. But just it felt like if it's not working, pull the plug and do something else. I think so many times founders just stay in the cycle where it's not working, not working, not working. And you're wasting so many people's money. And, and, and people's lives. I think that's lives. like, forget the yeah, money. It's unhappy. You're just like, yeah. it's, I'm more worried about the people. And you're just like, yeah, it's like, I don't, you know, with a billion and a half dollars, you, know, you can like stay alive forever, right? And waste a lot of human capital. So like, why would you do that? Like, it was not working. Go do something better. Yeah. I'm with you. All the founders out there, pay attention. Yeah. And all the founders know that if you're working with offline and slow, we're going <laughs> to tell you to shut your fucking companies down when they're not working. <laughs> We're going to sell your company to Microsoft. <laughs> so all the employees working for those founders think twice. But no, no, okay. no actually, no, no, it's a gift to the employees. Like, this is the, this is like the thing that's really hard for people to get their heads around. It. I know it feels shitty in the moment, but the absolute best thing a founder can do is call it and like pivot hard or shut it down. Figure out who wants to be on the boat and get off and be honest with employees because mm-hmm. it is like from my perspective, I don't care about the money. The money is the money, but it is like a real sin to knowingly waste people's time when they think something's worth working that you're like, that's not working, right? And like, look, I've gone through this in my life with pivots we've had to do with businesses I've been involved in. We're like, you know, just being really direct with people, telling the situation in the boat, off the boat, whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's critical, right? And I actually think it's extremely dishonest and dishonorable when founders like try to sell, sell people past reality to keep them on a boat that is sinking. Yeah. Totally. Or pull the ripcord when it's too late. And then, you know, you don't have enough time to give them adequate household. Yeah. Like you want to give self-direction. I mean, I've been through this where like, you know, some of the team believed in a new vision and some of the team didn't. And you're like, you give them a moment. You're like, this is like the decision for you to like, you, you can kind of put it back out. But like, I don't know. I, again, I, I, maybe the reason I'm so zen is I just, I really think all these companies are going bankrupt and going to waste a lot of time. So like, for me, it seems good for everyone. Okay. I'm, I'm compelled by that. I think it's a good argument. So I also think we'll see a lot, lot, lot more of this. Yeah. I mean, it very well may, if, if you believe as I do, that all the value is going to accrue to the top five players anyway, what you'd expect is that like on some non-zero timeline, but in the next few years, all the talent that got excited about these startup opportunities and went flying off into the hinterlands will be like, oh shit, we should go work for Meta and Google and Microsoft, and they'll all just recombine into the bo- into those units. Yeah. Okay. We'll watch this space very much. Couple more exciting things happening. We've got Reddit planning uh, its IPO. So as of this taping, they've they've priced the IPO. I think I'm getting some shares of this. By Four the way. to five times know. oversubscribed. Oh, that doesn't mean that doesn't anything. mean anything. It's priced at the top of the range, six and a half billion valuation. I'm just reading the stats right now. <laughs> yeah, no, no. 
That's just banker marketing. I know that's Goldman this like is doing a lot of marketing. marketing. Oversubscribed. I, that's one of how the, many shares are they floating? Most like companies used to be like twenty times oversubscribed. So I don't know if four to five is actually no, good it's or bad. Not. Like, I mean, like, <laughs> if you take shit. the banker marketing language and and like on the spectrum of what bankers always say, no, no, d- dog shit's three times oversubscribed. So five x <laughs> is a lot closer to dog shit than 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 the the massive winners. But look again, I I, I actually just heard out that I believe it or not, I'm gonna I'm gonna have some Reddit shares. How? Oh, great. So a How? Company? You found him on the street? Something sell to Reddit in your portfolio? Oh, something owns something that owns something that owns something that has Reddit shares, and it kind of trickles back through oh. to me. It's like finding ski jacket money. <laughs> ski ja- it is literally ski. Dave Morin is on two point. It's a ski jacket. This is ski jacket money. <laughs> Ski jacket shares. Well, you Condé Nast, yeah? big three cheers for Condé Nast. They'll make a million or so bucks on a billion no, or so billion. bucks. Oh, yeah, no, it's like I'm a sorry. million. Three cheers. <laughs> it's gonna take I, them. I far. misspoke. You know what they could do with that billion dollars? It will fund half of one AI startup. Shut down a lot of their publications and pivot. They're not that stupid to do that. But let's do now. This could this could age well or age poorly. But should we do some Reddit IPO predictions? So oh. who thinks like? Opening day, huge pop. Opening day, huge drop. Opening day, ho hum. I mean, it's gonna be ho hum. Well, the one vector of interest is aren't the Reddit community members gonna? Those people have no money, Brit. But I just watched Dumb Money. <laughs> great, great movie written by our friends Lauren and Rebecca. It was? Oh, okay. Yeah. I just watched it on my Peloton the other day while I was working out, and I was I knew the story, but it was just I didn't know the intricacies of how like all the Reddit community members were hyping onto it and Wall Street bets. And I mean, I, I don't know if there was one okay. community to do it, it would be Reddit. But they don't like, but they hate Reddit. Like the problem with these moderators is like, they're all like pissed that Reddit's getting commercial and changing. Like it's the opposite of Wall Street bets, right? Not if they can make a, a dime. <laughs> they buy a couple shares. I think, I think they'll make a dime. So <laughs> I think it's going to be very ho-hum because the reality is, and we saw this with, you know, the other companies that kind of eked out over the past year is the bankers are so cautious They're so careful. They're so want things to look pretty so that they have a pipeline of deals. So I think everyone's just being very conservative. And um, you have to price it, I think, a little bit for a pop because that is sort of the definition of success and the marketing of it. But the real question, of course, will be a month, two months, three months. Well, look, I mean, I think, I think, look, I think that you just look at like, you look at Instacart, I think they're very similar, right? They're like well-known brands. Some people like them. I actually, I'd much rather own, as I guess I do, a little bit of um, of Reddit than Instacart for a thousand reasons. It's much easier business. But like, what did Instacart do? It like opened at 30, a week later is at 29, then it like dropped down to like 22 now it's actually had a nice run is back up over its ipo price like that's kind of what i would expect isn't i'm just reading that reddit is also saying that sports data is seen as a revenue stream ahead of the ipo and like they're trying to sports improve data? sports betting pricing oh yeah betting <laughs> sports betting sports betting Obviously. why do you need reddit for sports betting people would use reddit as a platform for sports betting i mean they used it for wall street betting but wait, people are betting Zing. on like what the Reddit community is <laughs> doing Sam. or they're placing their bets. I'm confused. No, they're they're probably just using it for like, I don't know, hedge funds, like tr- figuring out the directions of people's trades for sports betting. Yeah, it's saying oh. that the data, their sports data is seen as a revenue stream ahead of the IPO. Look, I got to say, I think I, I always worry Ooh. about businesses that talking about their data streams as revenue. That's shit revenue. <laughs> like. It's like, in the end of the day, what Reddit is, it is another attention machine, with which does have a really interesting property, which is these niche communities. Most of them are worthless because they're unmonetizable. Some of them should be super monetizable, like the baby mom groups. Those things should be worth a fuckload, right? And so, yeah. like... We talked about how to make Reddit more profitable on a, one of the The podcasts. second that Reddit isn't... I just, I've seen this game, right, which is the second people are into, like, data streams. Those are, like one-time minorly valuable things, right? Do you guys like, remember when the Twitter API was going to be the 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 money pit for that oh, company? The surge, the surge yeah. in the, the market. Look, if Reddit really believes in the data business, that there was edge in it that was worth meaningful money, I would buy like in a theory of we're going to trade a Reddit hedge fund, right? Like we're going to keep the data. We'll trade the fund, right? We're going to yeah. make a shitload of money trading our That's own fund. 
well, the problem is, is it's really not a good idea. <laughs> but it's like, <laughs> Theor- and for for me, just to like be excited about. It's like if you said if you said to me like, hey, we're gonna set up the Reddit hedge fund and pull a bunch of people out of I don't know two sigma or something, right? And like we're just gonna like make a shitload of money and like we're not giving the data to anyone, then at least you're buying your own bullshit. The data is really valuable as a data stream. I just don't believe that there's that much money to be made in selling data streams to other people. And Sam, would that that theory extend to uh, using this data to train AI models as well? Well, Yeah, I just don't, (laughs) there's just no way. Yeah, I mean, those are like one-time fees type things. You give them out, maybe you make a little bit of money every year, but it's not like, when you say, how are you going to make billions of dollars, which is all that matters, to a company that's a $6 billion company trying to grow, it is not going to be selling small data streams. Like that might like plug a hole in your financials for a few years and mm-hmm. it's fine. But no one's investing in Reddit as a public company because they have some data streams to sell, right? <laughs> No, that's I'm just, just like, I, I'm just, I'm just telling, telling you what the people are talking about over on X. I know, but the people, again, like that's just like, that can't be the long term economic thesis for Reddit. All it can do is make their financials fluffed up a little bit. Most of it is advertising, there. right? Like it's, it's that's what it has to be. It's yeah, just that, which it's same just with that Instacart. Simple. To your point, right? Wasn't Instacart like an eighty twenty? I mean, the yeah. ad the ad revenue was really significant, and we all know how these ad businesses do. Right? Is like here's the funny thing: is like, yes, their whole story is all this high margin end cap style ad money is like where they're going to make all their money, but. My God, is that a lot of hard work mm-hmm. just to open up that opportunity, right? Like you're operating an entire extremely complicated infrastructure with all this logistics and humans and whatever. And it's like, what's the win? The win is like you get to sell end caps, right? Like I'm willing to lose money on supermarkets just to sell end caps. It just seems like way too much work for that win is my view. That's my issue with them. Like, now, the nice part about Reddit is it's just a website. Like it's a lot less work, right? <laughs> but but um. It is interesting. But they've for lost sure. money. I mean, yeah, I don't even uh, like they're continuing to lose money. But that's okay. They have I mean, seventy three like, million daily or daily actives, two hundred sixty seven million weekly actives, one hundred thousand active communities, and sixteen billion posts and comments. That's po- that's what they're measuring is the posts and comments. Yeah, I don't know. It seems a little abstract to me. It's super weird shit, and I believe the future is weird, and, like, the weird future is on Reddit. I think that's, like, the thesis you can have, and, like, you can say that some of them are monetizable, right? That's fine. I actually think that's a reasonable thesis. I don't know what it's worth. I don't know where it trades, but I can tell you this. If they're lauding their hole-filling data stream deals, that's a bad win. That's a bad public company because, like, there's only so much money in that. It's not scalable, and it's small. It's, like, that's not how you make billions of dollars. Yeah, I tend to agree, but... It's still, it, we'll see. And it'll be interesting to watch because it is quite central in terms of, I mean, it's a product a lot of people use. We're going to wrap soon, but Britt, could I um, do a pop culture corner and maybe start yeah. one going? And I, I've got something to share. And Sam, Ooh. I know you're brimming with wellness experiences over there if you feel like. Yeah, my pitch to Sam this week was to start Sam's Wellness Corner because he's always on some new diet I'm an or like So I think that is a problem routine. that you think I'm looking good. It totally is, Sam. I, you're looking very oh, svelte and glowing. Thank yeah, you. That's yeah. the lights in the pool house. But I had I did a CNBC there and I felt like, ah, my face was... Okay, so last night in San Francisco, I got to attend and moderate a conversation at a premiere of a new show. And it's called A Brief History of the Future. It mm-hmm. is produced by Catherine Murdoch and Ari Wallach, who Catherine it might be known as it. She's invest in a, mostly as uh, in climate uh, work, but also in democracy work and in kind of fixing some of society's big problems. And Ari is a futurist, so he does a lot of consulting about the future. And it's a really cool, it's a cool series. It's coming to PBS on April 3rd. And here's the premise. And actually, at first I thought this was, I was skeptical of this premise because I'm skeptical, but I've come around. So The idea is that most of the narratives about the future of technology are dystopian. It's, you know, the sci-fi kind of Blade Runner-esque, you know, all the things that could kind of go wrong. Catherine and Ari basically wanted to pursue a series if like the premise of which is what if we get it right? What if we actually use technology to make the world better? And to solve a lot of problems. Instead of science fiction, it's fantasy? Is that? (laughs) 
Uh, maybe. But I don't know. I mean, it, it also doesn't. I'm just fucking with you. Keep going. I know you are. It also doesn't. It doesn't like gloss over the potential downsides, which actually is something I, I think in in the, the episodes I've seen and in some of the trailers and such. So anyway, I just want to give it a plug. I'm actually particularly curious for what kind of the tech community, a lot of folks were there at the screening last night, kind of think about it. And I, I think it's some cool stuff. And, and they're also, I asked them, I was like, well, you know, why'd you choose PBS and not TikTok? just to be provocative. Turns out there, there it will be sliced and diced for TikTok as well, but they're also integrating with a lot of schools and education systems. And I think it's great for kids. So maybe not the trendiest of pop culture things, but very important. Was it good? What was the premiere? It was very like- good. I mean, it, it is, it's basically, you know, in a sort of docu-series style of profiling people who were, who were doing interesting things. So one was... Uh, climate, uh, someone who's actually, and I saw someone else tweet this today, but a company or entity that is, has nets in the ocean and is like literally mm. trolling for plastic, but doing it in a really smart mm. and interesting way. There were, there's a, some, someone who's building, our five-year-old is really into mushrooms, the plant, not, you know, the psychedelic. The psychedelic. And there, I need to get to the bottom of this company because they're, they're basically making everything out of like mycelium and all this kind oh. of stuff. So anyway, it's cool. It, there's a, a lot of, you know, there's some of that futuristic look at what this one person's doing, but also kind of this broader discussion of, you know, how do we think about what society we want to live in and and so forth. So I think it's thought provoking it. and recommend. Into it. Thanks, Jess. Yeah. What if it worked out, guys? What if it works out? I actually am. It is going to work out. It's me fine. We're You're secretly great. a more, Sam. Come over to our side. <laughs> no, no. I am a more in general. I just think we have to understand the double edged swords of these things. <laughs> it's like, it's like the, the climate scientists will fix it and there'll just be like too much ice and things will be like too green. Oh, I can't wait for that. Well, they day. showed this image of what New York could look sea like. Sea levels will fall and there'll be houses below sea level. Yeah. Houses below sea level. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. So that's <laughs> what I got on PCC. Sam or Britt, any any other recommendations? Thoughts? Recommendations, I don't know, but Princess Kate was spotted out and about, so she is alive and well. So but can, is she well? Because like I thought there's well, more. Well, then they had a security them. breach. Someone actually tapped into like the London hospital's medical records. <laughs> now stole her files. We haven't yet heard what happened, but now someone has the you know what, a she hacker should put them. involved. So she should put them on the blockchain. Guys, just let this woman recuperate in peace. Just saying, the saga continues. <laughs> I think I know the situation. I'll text it to you, but I'm not going to okay. say it on air. Okay, let me know. I got nothing. Um, no wellness. You were just going on and on about this this Look, thing you're eating. Do, do your sauna. Do your ice bath. <laughs> Turns out that Huel is not that tasty. Very deceiving. Huel, spell it. What is it? You don't get this Instagram ad constantly. Never. If you no, buy it's just Huel. you. No. Uh, Can you spell it for the listeners? H U E L, like fuel yeah, with it's an fine. H. Fine. I was like really excited about their mac and cheese, and it's just eh. You know, have your creatine. <laughs> to be clear, as we do, Jess, <laughs> the things that Sam just recommended are woefully not obvious slash inaccessible. And but the tone, don't be deceived by his tone of just do this, just do that. We'll we'll circle back to this. It's easy. By the way, everyone should be taking creatine, including women. I'm getting a lot of ads for this. We're gonna have to do a creatine episode. Yeah. I, I'm gonna dig deep. Collagen too. Let's peptides, all of it. We should t- we should really cover all that. If you're gonna do peptides, apparently it's the fish ones. They taste fine. They don't mess with your hormones, marine collagen people. I don't want my hormones messed with. No, but the collagen is just undeniable. And now there are gummies. I, I you guys get such different internet ads than I do. Yeah, I would be fascinated to see your internet. Me I'm worried about my kidneys. I just don't want to filter yeah. out all this shit I'm putting into my body. You know, me too. Like, I'm just, just eating vegetables and hoping for the best. <laughs> Well, like, who makes vegetables? Is that like a Me and my pot? garden. I have a garden. <laughs> oh, my God. Britt's garden. Yeah. Oh, I'd like a tour of that. By the way, it's very innovative. I have a like, hydroponic system. It's it's really cool. You started that like a decade ago. Way to go. You've still got it going. Thank you. Yeah. Wait, is this like just for leafy greens, your hydroponics? hydroponics no, I've got all work. kinds of stuff in this garden. I've got what? lots of berries. I've got pumpkins. Yeah. That's not supposed to work. Guys, you need to come visit my garden. It's We're going to come visit. Hydroponic strawberries is like the biggest breakthrough in history. Is the hydroponic, hydroponic farming strawberry. is so cool. 
Okay. okay. Brits we'll figured it out. With that, let's wish everybody a great rest of their week. Thank you for listening and sharing and commenting and giving us feedback. We've got a good, good couple of weeks teeing up. We've got some substitutes coming in. We've got the usual gang. So stay tuned and thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, guys. If you enjoyed this show, please leave us a virtual high five by rating it and reviewing it on Apple Podcast, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast. Find more information about each episode in the show notes and follow us on social media by searching for at more or less, at Dave Morin, at Lesson, at J Lesson, and as for me, I'm at Brit. See you guys next time.